the Germanic world is more spread out than most people think, and full of fascinating people and dialects, some of which you have to hear to believe. Das war ein sehr schlechter Hex. Die hat wohl nicht im Pub essen. Auf es, einfach. Hat sie mal eingesperrt, aber das Mal war gescheit und hat gesagt, weiß was, jetzt brauchen wir den Pub noch ein bisschen essen gehen, damit er ein bisschen dicker wird, weil er ist ja sehr mager. Now, can you guess where this speaker came from? Any ideas? Well, it's called Zipser German, and if you're really lucky, you might hear a bit of it in Slovakia or Romania, but you'd really have to go looking for it. It's one of those obscure German dialects in danger of extinction. That's right, it is not just giant pandas. Anyway, we are getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start right back at the beginning. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ollie Richards, and this channel is all about helping you learn a new language quickly using the power of story. So you can become fluent faster and live your best life. So the earliest stages of the German language was called Old High German, which existed roughly between the years 750 AD to 1050. Other West Germanic dialects on the continent fell under this umbrella too, and as you no doubt know from movies, this was a time of tribal kingdoms in Europe. Now check this out. The oldest surviving piece of German writing, and their very first masterpiece, it is an epic poem called The Song of Hildebrand, written in the 830s in Old High German. That's right. It is about a tragic encounter in battle between a father and his son who does not recognize him. Well, we can read it better here. These are the opening lines that you can see right here. And amazingly, this survived air raids, it survived being looted in war, treated with chemicals, torn apart, defaced, and even almost given to Hitler. Yeah. The West Germanic languages were probably mutually intelligible until around the eighth century, because then a big event changed the way that people spoke. And this was the High Germanic sound shift. Sounds very... Glorious, doesn't it? It didn't just happen suddenly, of course. It was a gradual change over a few centuries. Now, at first, sounds changed between vowels. Then sounds changed at the beginning of words. Altogether, nine consonants changed. And eventually, there were two distinct dialects. That's where we ended up, High German and Low German. The changes affected Dutch too, but English was actually completely unaffected by this change. Most of the changes have become part now of what we call modern standard. German. So what do High German and Low German mean? Well, it's not that one was a better language or anything like that. It was just geographical. Low German was spoken in the north of Germany, which is low-lying country, actually going into the part of the Netherlands too. And High German was spoken in the south of Germany at a higher elevation. These days, Low German is considered an old form of the language that survived the move to a, to a standard German. And it's mostly only older people who still speak it. Ich hef hüt in Zimmer von 18. He dreht den Kopf, blinkt den Toe und streckt sich und machen was so. Verschaut und lustig, swung mit den Beinen. Er spielt hier jungshaftig Footballspiel. Mit was? Mit dem Blatt. Mit Hupen wie es better. What do you think? Some people describe Low German as a sort of middle language between Standard German and Old Dutch. But it didn't stop at the high and low dialects, though. For a while, German people spoke increasingly differently from region to region to the extent that they battled to understand each other. They really needed to have one version of German that everyone could grasp. And so writers started working out a standard written language. But it took a few hundred years, and we've only had standard German since the 1800s. Now, standard German is based on high German phonetics, and there are three standard versions of this. German, Swiss, and Austrian. But while schools have to adhere to this written standard, there is actually no pronunciation standard, which is good news, right? You can get away with your own weird accent while you are learning the language. And let me tell you, there are a lot of German varieties out there. So let's see where German is spoken. German is an official language in four countries in the European Union. Germany, Austria, Belgium, and Luxembourg. It's also an official language in Switzerland and Liechtenstein as well. And there's a minority group in Poland too. Actually, Poland is the country with the most people learning German, nearly 2 million people. And ethnic Germans are a minority group in many other countries too. But let's check out Germany first. Hello, I am Anne and I come from Schwabeländle. This is in Baden-Württemberg. Schwaben, so in rund um Stuttgart drumherum, or we say, rund um Sturgart. Es gibt 
viele Diskussionen, ob Schwäbisch jetzt äh, eigene Sprache ist oder etwas. Eigentlich ist es bloß ein Dialekt. Aber ich denke, vor allem das alte Schwäbisch ist eigentlich eine Sprache für sich. Und ich möchte euch zeigen, warum ich das denke. Now that's the Swabian dialect. It's pretty cool, right? If you're a complete beginner, don't worry if all if it all sounds the same to you. It doesn't matter. But make no mistake, even German natives could have trouble understanding people from other parts of the country. So these are just some of the varieties of German. The spectrum of regional variations in the country is really quite colorful, and I love this. The thing is, it's easy to think of dialects as a sort of small town quirk or something, but dialects are an important part of cultural diversity. In nearby countries, things can get even more confusing as well. If you go to Switzerland, for example, it might become obvious that people sound a little different. Now, have you ever heard someone speaking Swiss German? I don't mean Swiss standard German that I mentioned earlier, but Swiss German is something else. It's a group of Alemannic dialects that sounds something like this. Hello, Zemme. Also, wie wir bei uns in der deutschen Zeit grüezi miteinander. Ich bin Julia und ich möchte euch heute gerne etwas über meine Muttersprache, das Schweizerdeutsche, erzählen und über meinen Dialekt oder mein Dialektgemisch. Ähm, darüber, wie es dazu gekommen ist und wie ich zu meiner Muttersprache stand. So nice, this. Many Germans say that they can't understand Swiss German varieties at all. In fact, TV interviews with Swiss German guests actually need subtitles. Interestingly, even with five million speakers, it has no written standard and is unrecognized in Switzerland uh, in favor of the standard German. And this means that you can't learn to write in Swiss German. I mean, okay, text messaging and so on can be done. You'd use basic German grammar rules and then just, boy, just write the words the way they're said. But no spelling rules. I mean, how do you like that? It sounds quite cool, doesn't it? But dialects like Swiss German are important to try and preserve because they hold so many cultural memories. Things like traditional songs people grew up with and, and things like that. Now, the vernacular of Liechtenstein is quite close to this version, by the way. Liechtenstein is a tiny, beautiful country right in the heart of Europe, a land that once endured savage witch hunts, but now offers quite the idyllic lifestyle with peace and a stunning Alpine view. Here's something you might not know. German is an official language in the South Tyrol part of Italy, and that's the northernmost point. It used to belong to Austria, but was given to Italy after World War I, despite the fact that everyone spoke German. Now, speaking of Austria, I've heard travelers say the dialect in this beautiful country can be very polite compared to Germany. And just like Germany and Switzerland, Austria has tons of regional variations. The Viennese dialect, for one, can even be hard for other Germans to recognize because it has a lot of influence from other languages. But outside of Europe, German is big too. The US has 1.4 million native speakers, and in one particular state, they have a rather unusual way of speaking. Ich heiße Vernell Ayla. Uh, ich bin six miles nördlich von Friedrichsburg geboren. Zu die Zeit haben wir normale Kinder noch zu Hause geboren. <laughs> Now, if you haven't heard of Texas German, uh, don't worry, not many people have. It is a remnant of a thriving German immigrant culture from the 1840s. There's a drive to protect this endangered variety, and one Texas university is even recording people speaking it, which is a fantastic initiative. Okay, so Germans settled in America, not that surprising. But have you heard of this German community? Well, if you love sand dunes, shipwrecks, and all things African, this country on the southwest coast of Africa makes a very adventurous place to learn German. It is Namibia. Now, 20,000 German Namibians live here, and they are descendants of German colonists. And all over the town, you'll see German schools, German churches, German street names, German beer. That's Japanese, well, whatever. German is a national language here. They call their dialect Southwest German, or Namdeutsch. And as you might expect, it has lots of peculiarities with influence from local languages. Virtually all German Namibians are also fluent in Afrikaans and can also speak English. Now, one country that you probably already know has German immigrants is Russia. In the 18th century, the young Empress Catherine the Great invited Germans and other Europeans to come and settle in Russia. She made a pretty compelling case. In the manifesto she signed, they were offered free land, exemption from military service, and were allowed to keep speaking German. So why not? 
Well, today there are 800,000 people with German roots still living in Russia. There are lots more settler stories like these and other places in the world with German communities. But the main reason we talk about it is to show you there are so many options if you want to immerse in the language you're learning. You really are never limited to just one country. So here is a big question. Why is German worth learning? Why indeed? Is it really that useful a language? Well, let's think about this. German is the 11th most spoken language in the world and the most spoken mother tongue in Europe behind uh, Italian, French, Spanish and English. And that's 16% of all Europeans. And all over the world, we're talking 200 million German speakers. In fact, after the US, Germany is the second most popular country to emigrate to, which is quite an amazing statistic. It's not just because it's an economic powerhouse. Germany has a high standard of living, so it offers security. No surprise in that over 15 million people are currently learning German. It's also the second most widely used scientific language. Doctors, medical researchers, engineers, these make up a lot of the students. But let's get to the fun part, German vocabulary. Now, there is a reason that I will not play Scrabble with a German, and here is that reason. German is famous for ridiculously lengthy words. As Mark Twain said, some German words are so long that they have perspective. But before we judge them, there is a method to the madness. So check this out. If we wanted to say claustrophobia in English, it might be the idea of space plus fear. So we add space and fear and we get a different word, claustrophobia. In German, you can just add the two words together. Platzangst gives you Platzangst. So you see how it works now? Pretty logical, right? Now, okay, I know that I used a short example, but you see my point. Why borrow from Greek and Latin to describe something when you can just glue your own nouns together? Quite cool, right? And that's all it is. Those super long words are simply compound words. Mind you, if you're having an allergic reaction and your mouth is swelling up, you might want to know the sign language for this particular word for food intolerance. Yeah, I'm not gonna try saying that one. The reason for the long words is that German doesn't allow you to describe nouns with other nouns. So where in English you'll just write a bunch of nouns to describe the final noun, Germans leave out those unnecessary spaces and form one word out of it. If you have trouble understanding them, just try to think of them all as separate little words glued together. For example, in English we say birthday present, two separate words. German combines them into one, Geburtstags and Geschenk. Geburtstags Geschenk. But it is not all difficult compound words, though there are lots of easy words as well to get you started, like these ones you can see here on the screen, which really are nice and easy. There's one lovely word that German voted as their most beautiful word of all, Geborgenheit. There isn't an exact English translation, but it describes an intensely comforting feeling, like a moment of unadulterated peace and happiness. And if you want to feel unadulterated happiness, then you should like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications because I have a lot of comforting language videos still coming as well. Now, speaking of comfort, it's kind of a weird word to be using in a German video. I want to reassure you about something else. You can stop worrying about all those strange letters that German has because there's only four of them. Here they are. See, it's not that alarming really. This one here is just like a double S and you pronounce it like a S in song. And the dots on these three here just mean a slightly different pronunciation of those vowels. They're called umlauts, and umlauts mean, it means like an around sound in German. One of the Grimm brothers actually came up with this. Yeah, the same guy who wrote the, uh, the fairy tales, you know? See, I told you German was interesting. The rest of the German alphabet is exactly like English, and pronunciation is pretty rigid for the most part. Once you know all the different sounds, it will be the same no matter what word you are saying. What most people find intimidating, though, is the grammar, and German has three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter, and the case forms for each of them are also different. Have a look. And that is just for the definite articles, because yeah, unfortunately, there are more, and this will probably be one of your biggest challenges in German. And in the description below, I've put a link to one of my most popular articles on, on decoding and understanding the German cases that you might like to check out. But you can gradually build up your understanding of these tricky grammar areas through practice and exposure. And look, immersion is always the key to this. I can't emphasize enough how important immersion and context is. I don't believe on focusing too much on grammar rules because you just end up tying yourself in these knots. And if you struggled with German grammar in the past, then I've got something cool for you in just a minute, so stay around. Now, if you still need convincing that German is amazing, then let me remind you of what German minds have come up with in the past. Sigmund Freud transformed the study of psychology. Albert Einstein 
revolutionized our understanding of science. And then there is this. Amazing. And to think that Bach is just one of many master composers who were German. The German language even gave us our first printed book. It was the Gutenberg Press that was invented in Germany, initially to print the Bible. Martin Luther is the guy who made that happen. At the time, there was only a written standard for German, because since everyone wanted a copy of the printed Bible, printed people everywhere learned this form of German by reading it, and eventually it became the spoken standard too. Incidentally, the first magazine in the world was also printed in German. And today, 10% of the world's books are published in German. So anyway, enough compelling reasons to learn German. I'm sure you will agree. But earlier I mentioned that I'm not a fan of learning a language by focusing on the grammar. And if you've tried to learn German in the past, then you may well be thinking, Ollie, what are you smoking? I need that grammar. But look, the best way to learn a rich language like German is with a method that uses stories so that you can enjoy the language and learn the grammar naturally the way that native speakers do. And in this video, I show you exactly how to do this. It's a simple, kind of strange, but very effective way to learn German or any other language using stories. And in fact, it's called the story learning method. So click the video over here and take a look. If you want to learn German or if you struggled with German grammar in the past, then learning with stories is gonna be the most fun way of sorting that out.